novelists and critics of the 1940s. It is a rare and lucky physician who can predict accurately at birth whether a child is to become a dwarf or a giant or an ordinary adult, since most babies look alike and curious arrangements of chromosomes which govern status are inscrutable and do not yet yield their secret order even to the shrewdest eye. Time alone gives definition. Nevertheless, less interested readers and writers like anxious parents and midwives forever speculate upon the direction and meaning of current literary trends, and professional commentators with grave authority make analysis which the briefest interval often declares invalid. But despite their long historic record of bad guesses, bookish men continue to make judgments, and the recorded derelictions of taste in the erratic judgments of earlier times tend only to confirm in them a sense of complacency. They are not we, and did not know... We know. To disturb this complacency is occasionally worthwhile, and one way of doing it is to exhume significant critical texts from the recent past. Those of the last century, in particular, provide us with fine warnings. For instance, we do not believe any good end is to be affected by fictions which fill the mind with details of imaginary vice and distress and crime, or which teach it instead of endeavoring after the fulfillment of simple and ordinary duty to aim at the assurance of superiority by creating for itself fanciful and incomprehensible perplexities. Rather, we believe that the effect of such fictions tend to render those who f fall under the influence un fit for practical exertion by intruding on minds which ought to be guarded from impurity, the unnecessary knowledge of evil. This was the quarterly review on George Eliot's The Mill and the Floss, and it is really quite well said, the perennial complaint of the professional reviewers and the governors of lending libraries, enough unpleasant things in the world without reading about them in books, or the following attack on Preciosity and Obscuritanism, Blackwood's Magazine, 1817. Mr. Coleridge conceives himself to be a far greater man than the public is likely to admit, and if we wish to waken him from what seems to us a most ludicrous del delusion, he seems to believe that every tongue is wagging in his praise. The truth is that Mr. Coleridge is but an obscure name in English literature. Coleridge was 45 years old at this time, and his major work was long since done. In London, he is well known in literary society for his extraordinary loquacity. And there follows a prolix attack upon Biographia Literaria, or in this excerpt from an 1848 quarterly review deploring the pagan, the sexual, and the vicious. At all events, there can be no interest attached to the writer of Wuthering Heights, a novel succeeding Jane Eyre, and purporting to be written by Ellis Bell, unless it were for the sake of more individual reprobation. For, there, for though there is a decided resemblance between the two, yet the aspect of the Jane and Rochester animals in their native state, as Catherine and Heatfield, sick, is too odiously and abominably pagan to be palatable even to the most <laughs> vitiated class of English readers. With all the unscrupulousness of the French school of novels, it combines that repulsive vulgarity and the choice of its vice which supplies its own antidote. Differently worded, these complaints still sound in our press. The loose editors who cry for an affirmative literature echo voices once raised against George Eliot. When middle-brow reviewers deplore morbidity in our best writers, they only paraphrase the outrage of those who found the Brontes repellent and the twitterings of an Orville Prescott when he had, has discovered a nice and busy book echoed the same homely song of those long-dead reviewers who found in the three-volume novels of forgotten lady writers so much warm comfort. As the essential problems of life remain the same from generation to generation, despite altered conditions, so the problems of literary recognition remain, for contemporaries peculiarly difficult. Despite the warnings of other times, the impetuous and the confident continue their indiscriminate cultivation of weeds at the expense of occasional flowers. To consider the writing of any period, including the present, it is perhaps of some importance to examine the climate in which the work is done, to chart, if possible, the prevailing winds, the weather of the day. 
Today, there is a significant distinction between the reviewers for popular newspapers and magazines, whom no one is whom no one inter interested in literature reads, and the serious critics of the academy, who write for one another in the quarterlies and occasionally for the public in the Sunday supplements. The reviewers are not sufficiently relevant or important to be considered in any but a social sense. They reflect the commonest prejudices and aspirations of the middle class for whom they write, and they need not concern us here. The critics, however, are significant. They are dedicated men, they are serious, their learning is often respectable. They have turned to the analysis of literature with the same intensity that, born in an earlier time, they might have brought to formal philosophy, to the law, to the ministry. They tend, generically and inevitably, to be absolutist. They believe that by a close examination of the text, the laws at the crafty strategies of its composition will be made clear and the findings will provide touchstones for a comparative criticism of other works. So far, so good. They have constructed constructed some ingenious and perhaps valuable analysis, analysis of metaphysical verse whose order is often precise and whose most disparate images proceed with the calculable wit and logic. Unfortunately, the novel is not so easily ex explicated, and it's, it is a loose form, and although there is an inherent logic in those books we are accustomed to call great, the deductible laws which govern the execution of Emma are not going to be much use in defining the idiot. The best that a serious analyst can hope to do is comment intelligently from his vantage point, in time on the way a work appears to him in a contemporary, a comparative, or a historic light in which case his opinion is no more valuable than his own subtlety and knowledge. He must be, as T.S. Eliot put it so demurely, very intelligent. The point, finally, is that he is not an empiricist dealing with measurable quantities and calculable powers. Rather, he is a man dealing with the private vision of another, with a substance as elusive and amorphous as life itself. To pretend that there are absolutes and necessary in making relative judgments, Faulkner writes better than Taylor Caldwell, but to believe that there are absolutes and to order one's judgments accordingly is folly and disastrous. One is reminded of Matthew Arnold and his touchstones. It was his conviction that certain lines from a poet by all conceited great might be compared to those of lesser poets to determine their value. Arnold selected Dante as his great poet, an irreproachable choice, but then he misread the Italian, which naturally caused some confusion. Arnold's heirs also demanded order, tidiness, labels, ultimate assurance that this work is good and that the work is bad, but sooner or later someone misreads the Italian and the system breaks down. In our time, there are nearly as many critical systems as there are major critics, which is a pleasing anarchy. The new critics, as they have been termed, they, at least dislike being labeled and few will now answer when called, are fundamentally mechanics. They go about dismantling the text with the same rapture that their simpler brothers experience while taking apart combustion engines, and veterate tinkerers both solemnly playing with what has been invented by others for use, not analysis. Today's quarterlies are largely house organs for the academic world. They seldom publish imaginative work, and one of their most distinguished editors has declared himself more interested in commentaries on writing them than in the writing itself. Their quarrels and schisms and heresies do not, in the least, resemble the Alexandrians whom they occasionally mention, with a volative pride as spiritual ancestors. Rather, one is reminded of the semantic and doctrinal quarrels of the church fathers in the 4th century when a diphthong was able to break the civilized world in half and spin civilization into nearly a millennium of darkness. One could invent a most agreeable game of drawing analogies between the 4th century and today F.R. Levis and St. Jerome are perfectly matched, while John Christosom and John Crow Ransom suggest a possibility. The analogy works amusingly on all levels, save one. The church fathers had a Christ to provide them with a primary source of revelation, while our own dogmatists must prefer, demand must depend either upon private systems or else upon those proposed by such slender reeds as Matthew Arnold and T.S. Eliot, 
each despite his genius, a ritual victim as well as a hero of literary fashion. But the critics are indefatigable, and their game is in earnest, for it is deeply involved not only with literature, but with such concrete things as careers in the academy, where frequent and prestigious publication is important. Yet for all their busyness, they are by no means eclectic. In a Henry James year, not one will write an analysis of George Meredith. They tend to ignore the contemporary writers, not advancing much later than F. Scott Fitzgerald, whose chief attraction is that he exploded before he could be great, providing a grim lesson in failure that, in its completeness, must be awfully heartening when contemplated on a safe green campus of some secluded school. Of the critics today, Edmund Wilson, the most interesting and the most important, has shown virtually no interest in the writing of the last 15 years. His talents engaged elsewhere in the construction of the heroic sepulchers for old friends like Fitzgerald and Millay, a likable loyalty, but a not entirely useful one. He can, of course, still make a fine point during a peacock flurry, and he has been startling he has been startlingly <laughs> he has been startling brilliant in the recent essays on Grant and Lincoln. But one can search the pages of that book of which he calls a literary chronicle of the forties, without coming up upon any but the most cursory mention of the decade's chief talents. Malcolm Cowley, a good professional literary man, had some sharp things to say recently about the young writers. Although he made almost no reference to the better writing of the day, he did say some accurate things about the university-trained writers, whose work, he feels, is done with too reverent an eye upon their old teachers, the new critics. Cowley speaks out for a hearty freedom from university influence, citing his own generation. The men of the 1920s are loyal to their time, if not to one another. Everyone was a genius then, and liquor was cheap abroad, as being singularly independent of formal instruction. Yet McCullers, Bowles, Capote, etc., like Hemingway, Faulkner, O'Neill, etc., are not graduates of universities, and many of the other young lions have had enough war to wash them clean of academicism. Mr. Cowley, like most commentators, tends to bend whatever he finds to his premise. To him, there is no single genius who can set the tone for a generation, but one wonders if he would recognize that great writer any more than Lord Jeffrey, a century ago, was able to recognize his time's greatness. For the Cowleys, the novel stopped at Gatsby. That Carson McCullers, whom does not mention whom he does not mention, has influenced many works, that Tennessee Williams has influenced the theater of the world, that Paul Bowles, among others, has reshaped the short story, none of these things impinges on him. Mr. Cowley's gloom is supported by the young John W. Aldridge, Jr. In his amusing novel, After the Lost Generation, he got onto the subject of values, by way of Lionel Trilling and perhaps V.S. Pritchard. Pritchard. After discussing a number of fictitious characters who were writing books using real, of unlikely names like Truman Capote and Gore Vidal, he proved, by the evidence of their works, that they had all failed of greatness because, except for a pocket of two manors, the army, the south, here and there in New England, there was really nothing left to write about, none of that social conflict out of which comes art, like sparks from a stone grinding metal. His coda indicated that a young writer of singular genius is at this moment hovering in the wings awaiting his cue. It will be interesting to read Mr. Aldridge's next novel. Yet Mr. Aldridge does have a case. The old authority of church, of settled Puritan morality, has broken down. And if one vision and if one's vision is historically limited to only a few generations in time, it might seem that today's novelists are not having the fun their predecessors in the 1920s had, breaking cultural furniture. But to take a longer view, one must recall that the great times for literature and life were those of transition, from the Middle Ages to modern times by way of the Renaissance, from dying paganism to militant Christianity by way of the Ant Antonines, and so on back to Aristophanes. The opportunity for the novelist, when Mr. Aldridge's values are in the discard, is fabulous, to create without wasting one substance in political or social opposition. What could be more marvelous? Neither Virgil nor Shakespeare had to attack their day's morality or those in authority. They were morally free to write of life, of Henry James's is the main thing. There were certainly inequities in bar barbary, <laughs> barbary, <laughs> I can't say it, guys. 
barbarities <laughs> in 16th century England and 1st century Rome, but the writers affected partly by convention, not to mention the Star Chamber, did not address themselves to attacks upon government or the time's morality, which apparently did not obsess them. Writers, after all, are valuable in spite of their neuroses, obsessions, and rebellions, not because of them. It is a poor period indeed which must assess its men of letters in terms of their opposition to their society. Opposition to life's essential conditions, perhaps, or to death's impla implacable tyranny is something else again and universal. But novels, no matter how clever, which attempt to change statutes or moral attitudes are, though useful at the moment, not literature at all. In fact, Mr. Aldrich were right in his proposition we wouldn't have not a barren, subjectless world for literature, but the exact opposite. A time of flowering, of creation without waste and irrelevancy. Unhappily, American society has not changed that much in the last 30 years. There is as much to satirize, as much to protest as ever before, and it will always be the task of the secondary figures to create those useful public books whose momentary effect is as stunning as their literary value is not. There is no doubt but that the West has come to Malraux's Twilight of the Absolute. One awaits with hope the period between when, unencumbered by the junk of dogma, writers can turn to the great things with confidence and delight. Loss of authority by removing targets does not destroy the true novelist, though it eliminates the doctrinaire of those and those busy critics who use the peculiar yardstick of, culture, or of social usefulness to determine merit. It is no accident that the few works admired by Mr. Aldridge are those compositions which sturdily and loudly discuss the social scene, or some pocket of it. Interesting books, certainly, whose public effect is often admirable, though the noise they create seldom persists long enough to enjoy even a first echo. Actually, one might say that it is only the critic who suffers unduly from the lack of authority. A critic, to criticize, must sim very simply have standards. To have standards, he must pretend that there, there is some optimum against which like creations can be measured. By the nature of his own process, he is eventually forced, often inadvertently, to accept as, an absol as absolute those conditions for analysis, which he has only tentatively proposed. To be himself sign significant, he needs law and revealed order. Without them, he is only a civilized man commenting for others upon given works which temperamental temperamentally, he may or may not like without altering the value, if any, of the work examined. With a law, with authority, with faith, he becomes something more grand and more and meaningful, the Pythonist through whom passes Apollo's word. Much of the despondency and apparent confusion in the world of peripheral letters today derives partly from the nervous, bloody age in which we live and partly from that hunger for the absolute, which in our own immediate experience delivered two great nations into the hands of tyrants, while in our own country the terror of being man alone, unsupported by a general religious belief and undirected by central authority, has reduced many intellectuals either to oblique nihilism or worse, to the acceptance of some external authority. Rome, Marx, Freud. One is reminded of Flaubert's comment nearly a century ago. The melancholy of the ancients seems to me deeper than that of the moderns, who all more or less assume an immortality on the far side of the black pit. For the ancients, the black pit was infinity itself. Their dreams take shape and pass against the black a background of unchanging ebony. No cries, no struggles, only the fixity of the pensive gaze. The gods being dead and Christ not yet born. There was between Cicero and Marcus Aurelius one unique moment in which there was man. Our own age is one of man alone, but there are still cries, still struggles against our condition, against the knowledge that our works and days have value only on the human scale, and those who most clearly remember the secure authority of other times, the ordered universe, the in immutable moral hierarchies are the ones who most protest the black pit. While it is perfectly true that any instant in human history is one of transition, ours more than most seems to be marked by a startling variety of conflicting absolutes, none sufficiently great at this moment to impose itself upon the majority whose lives are acted out within an unhuman universe, which some will still prefer to fill with a vast man-like shadow containing stars. 
while, while others behold only a luminous dust which is stars and us as well. This division between those who recognize the unhumanity of creation and those who protest the unchanging ebony sets the tone of our literature. With the imaginative writers inclining each in his own way to the first view and their critics to the second. The sense of man not being king of creation, nor even the work of a king of creation, is the burden, directly and indirectly, of modern literature. For the writers, there is no reality for man except his relations with his own kind. Much of the stuff of earlier centuries, like fate, high tragedy, the interventions of Deus Machina, have been discarded as brave but outworn devices, not applicable in a world where kings and commoners occupy the same sinking boat. Those of our writers who might yet enjoy the adjective affirmative are the ones who tend to devote themselves to the dramas within the boat, the encompassing cold sea ignored in the passions of the human moment. Most of the worst and a number of the best writers belong to this category. The key words here are love and compassion. And though, like most such devices, they have grown indistinct with use, one can still see them at work, and marvelously so, in the novels of Carson McCullers, and certain, though not all, of the plays of Tennessee Williams. Christopher Isherwood once said that to his mind the finest single line in Modern letters, my modern letters was, I have always depended upon the kindness of strangers from a streetcar named Desire. At such moments, in such works, the human drama becomes so unbearably intense that time and sea are blotted out, and only the human beings are illuminated as they cease, through the high magic of art, to be mere residents in a time which stops and become, instead, archetypes, elemental figures like those wild gods our ancestors people heavened with, peopled heaven with. Then there are writers to whom neither sea nor boat exists. They have accepted some huge fantasy wherein they need, they need never drown, where death is life and the doings of human beings on a social and ethical level are of much consequence to some brooding source of creation who dispenses his justice along strictly party lines at the end of the gloomy day. To this category belong such talented writers as Graham Greene and Evelyn Waugh. In theory, at least, speculation has ended for them. Dogma supports them in all things, yet it is odd to find that the tone of their works differs very little from that of other mariners adrift. They are, if anything, perhaps a bit more lugubrious, since for them is not the principality of this world. Finally, there are those who see human lives as lunatic workings of compulsive animals no sooner born than dead, no sooner dead than replaced by similar creatures born of that proliferating seed which too will die. Paul Bowles is a striking example of this sort of a writer as he coolly creates nightmare visions in which his specimens struggle and drown in fantasy, in madness, and death. His short stories with their plain lines of monochromatic prose exploit extreme situations with a chilling resourcefulness. He says, in short, let it sink, let us drown. Carson McCullers, Paul Bowles, Tennessee Williams are, at this moment at least, the three most interesting writers in the United States. Each is engaged in the task of truth saying, as opposed to saying the truth, which is not possible this side of revelation. Each has gone further into the rich interior of the human drama than any of our immediate predecessors, with the possible ex exception of William Faulkner, whose recent work has unfortunately resembled bad translations from Pindar. On a social level, the hostility shown these essential artists is more significant than their occasional worldly successes, for it is traditional that he who attempts to define man's conditions demoralizes the majority. Whether relativist or absolutist, we do not, ev we do not want ever to hear that we will die, but that first we must live. And those ways of living which are the fullest, the most intense, and the are the very ones which social man traditionally dreads summoning all his superstition and, mal and malice to combat strangers and lovers, the eternal victims. The obsessive concern with sexuality, which informs most contemporary writing, is not entirely the result of a wish epator le bourgeois, but more the reflection of a serious battle between the society man has construct constructed so illogically and confusedly in the nature of the human being, which needs a considerably fuller expression sexually and emotionally than either the economics or morality of this time will permit. The sea is close. Two may find the interval between awareness and death more meaningful than one alone. 
Yet while ours is, is a society where mass murder and violence are perfectly ordinary and their expression in the most popular novels and comic books ex is accepted with aplomb, any love between two people which does not conform is attacked. Malcolm Cowley has complained that writers no longer handle some of the more interesting social relationships of man, that there is no good stock market novel, no Balzician concern, Bal Balzac, Balzician concern among the better writers with economic motive. His point is valid. The public range of the novel has been narrowed. It would be good to have well-written accounts of the way we live now, yet our important writers eschew most deliberately, it would seem, the kind of book which provided not only Trollope but Tolstoy with so much power. Mr. Cowley catches quite well the tone of the second-rate good writers, a phenomenon peculiar to this moment. It seems as if a whole generation writes well, though not often to the point. They are concerned with the small scale, and goodness is ex exemplified by characters resembling the actress Shirley Booth, holding out valiantly against villainous forces, usually represented by someone in business. But Mr. Cowley does not mention the novelist from whom these apotheosis in the kitchen writers derive. Carson McCullers using the small scale, the relations of human beings at their most ordinary transcends her milieu and shows in bright glimpses the potentiality in which exists in even the most banal of human relationships, the we as opposed to the meager I. Or again, in Tennessee Williams's remarkable play, Camino Real, though the world is shown in a nightmare glass, a vision of those already drowned, there are still moments of private triumphs. In Kilroy's love with, not for, the gypsy's daughter and Lord Byron's proud departure through the gate in terra incognita, his last words of reproach and an exhortation: make voyages, make voyages. And finally, most starkly, we have a deliberate act of murder, Gide's Leacht Gratitude, which occurs at the end of Paul Bowles's Let It Come Down. Here, the faceless, directionless protagonist, in a sudden storm of rage against his life, all life, commits a murder without reason of, or passion, and in this one terrible moment, similar perhaps to that of a nation gone to war, he at last finds a place in the world, a definite status, precise relationship with the rest of men, even if it had been, even if it had to be of open hostility. It was his, created by him. In each of these three writers, man acts through love, through hate, through despair. Though the act in each is different, the common emotion is sufficiently intense to dispel. For a time at least, the knowledge of that cold drowning which awaits us all. The malady of civilized man is his knowledge of death. The good artist, like the wise man, addresses himself to life and invests with his private vision the deeds and thoughts of men. The creation of a work of art, like an act of love, is our one small yes at the center of a vast no. The lesser writers whose works do not impress Mr. Cowley, despite their correctness, possess the same vision as those of the major writers, but their power of il illusion is not so great and their magic is only fitful. Too often, their creatures are only automaton <laughs> automatons acted upon. Though they may shed light on interesting aspects of ordinary life, they do not. In the best sense, illuminate, flood with brilliance, our strange estate. Among the distinguished second rank of young writers, there is much virtuosity and potentiality. Potentiality. The coolly observant short stories of Louis Auchincloss provide wise social comment of the sort which the Cowleys would probably admire but never seem to read in their haste to generalize. Eudora Welty fathoms a subtle line in. Jean Stafford, though currently obsessed with lit literary interior decoration, has in such stories as The Echo and the Nemesis displayed a talent which makes all the more irritating her recent catalogs of bric-a-brac, actual and symbolic. John Kelly, whose two novels have been neglected, has created a perverse operatic world like nothing else in our literature. While the late John Horn Burns, out of fashion for some years, was a brilliant satirist, in a time when satire is necessary but difficult to write, since to attack successfully, one must have a complacent, massive enemy. And though there are numerous villains today, none is entirely complacent. The serious writers have been attacked by the reviewers for their contempt of narrative and their neglect of fashion. Real-life characters, which means familiar stereotypes from Victorian fiction masquerading in contemporary clothes. 
The reviewers have recognized that a good deal of writing now being done doesn't resemble anything they are used to, although in almost a century there has been a royal line of which they are ignorant, from the temptation of St. Anthony to the golden bowl of to Mrs. Dalloway. They still feel most at home with the newcomes, or if they came to maturity in the 1920s, with the sun also rises. When the technique of a play like Camino Real seems bizarre and difficult to follow for those accustomed to the imitators of Ibsen, there must be a genuine reason for the change in technique, other than the author's presumed perversity. The change from the exterior to the interior world, which has been taking place in literature for at least a century, is due not only to a general dissatisfaction with the limitations of naturalism, but also to the rise of the new medium, the movies, which properly used are infinitely superior to the old novel and to the naturalistic play, especially in the rendering of plain narrative. The Quiet One, a movie, was far superior as social document as art, too, for that matter, to any book published so far in this country dealing with Negro problems. Instinctively, the writers have reacted to the camera. If another medium can handle narrative and social comment so skillfully, even on their lowest aesthetic levels, then the novelist must go deeper, must turn to the maze of consciousness where the camera cannot follow. He must also become wise, and wisdom, even in its relative sense, was never a notable characteristic of novelists in our language. One can anticipate the direction of the novel by studying that of the painters who, about the time of the still camera's invention, began instinctively to withdraw into a less literal world where they might do work which a machine could not imitate. It is a possibility, perhaps even a probability, that as the novel moves toward a pure, more private expression, it will cease altogether to be a popular medium, becoming, like poetry, a cloistered evocation, in which case those who in earlier times might have written great public novels will be engaged to write good public movies, redressing the balance. In our language, the novel is but three centuries old, and its absorption by the movies, at least the vulgar line of it, is not necessarily a bad thing. In any event, it is already happening. For the present, however, the tone of the contemporary novel, though not cheerful, is precise. Man is on his own. In certain human actions, in love and violence, he can communicate with others. Touch and be touched, act, and in the act forget his fate. The scale is often small. Kings are neglected because, to relativists, all men are the same within eternity, or rather their crisis is the same. The concern in modern letters is with that crisis which defines the prospect. In general, the novelists have rejected authority, parting company with their cousins, German, the serious critics. To the creative man, religious dogma and political doctrine, when stated in ultimate terms, represent the last enemy, the protean Lucifer in our race's bloody progress. The artist speaks from the aware that awareness of life, that secret knowledge of life and death, the absolutists are driven to obscure and to distort, to shape, if possible, to two tidy ends. The interior drama at its most bitterly human comes into sharp focus in the writings of Williams and McCullers, and there are signs that other writers, undismayed by the hostility of the absolutists, may soon provide us with some strength in these last days before the sure if temporary victory of the of that authoritarian society which thanks to science, now has every weapon with which to make even the most inspired lover of freedom conform to the official madness. The thought of heaven, a perennial state of mind, a cheerful conception of what might be in life, in art, if not in death, may yet save our suicidally inclined race, if only because heaven is as various as there are men in the world who dream of it, and writers to evoke that dream. One recalls Constantine, to refer again to the image of the early church, when he teased a dissenting bishop at one of the synods, Asius, take a ladder and get up to heaven by yourself. We are fortunate in our time to have so many ladders going up. Each ladder is raised in hope, which is heaven enough. New World Writing, number 4, 1953.